they always give me that warning now. Um, all right, so let me share my screen with you guys. And what we're going to be doing today is just talking about um, the program itself, stuff that you guys need to know, um, you know, as far as registering for classes. Normally, when we were in school, <clears throat> which <clears throat> I hope to be in the fall, and we'll talk about that in a minute. When we were in school, we would uh, sort of, um, during the orientation, hand out uh, the forms and just have you sign off on them and register you then. Um, because we're doing it in this format, we'll have to do it individually via email. Um, but um, Janine Rosenberger will get you registered for everything. We lock all the funeral service classes down just so, um, you know, you have to be approved to take them. We don't want somebody who is, let's say they're in the nursing program, they have a free elective and they go, oh, I'll take embalming lab because that sounds interesting, which I'm sure it is interesting, especially to somebody from outside of the field. But, uh, you know, we, we, we can't have that. So, so we keep them all locked down just for that reason. So it just, it, it's all through me and Janine. Um, normally, and what we've been doing recently is just, like I said, be, by email, um, I'll approve you, shoot an email to Janine, and then she'll shoot you an email saying that, okay, you've been registered for this, that, and the other thing. So, all right, so basics about the program itself. Let me move this up here, it always gets in the way. Um, so full-time normally, you know, um, which we're getting back to, uh, the program takes two semesters. Um, you know, the fall and the spring. We're here Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Um, and it used to be like when I was a student, it was like we were here like nine to five on those three days. But now all of the classes are blended or hybrid. <clears throat> so half of the class information is done in class, half it is done online. So what used to be a three hour class is now an hour and a half. And the units that are done online, we have modules that go along with them. And, and you know, it's, it's, we've found this is sort of the best of both, both worlds because we're not just sort of throwing you to the wolves and saying, go figure it out on your own. Because we still cover those units very briefly in class and we can take time to talk about topics in them or questions or anything like that. But like I said, it, it takes what used to be a three hour class and makes it an hour and a half. Um, so normally you're on campus, you know, something like 10 to three, um, you know, I know like Mondays and we'll cover the specifics here in a bit is like um, noon to three. Uh, Wednesdays are a little bit longer because there's lab and field experience in the afternoon and I'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, and uh, so that's normally like 1030 to four or 1030 to five, depending on if you're in lab or field experience. And those are tentative times because something like lab and bombing lab is if we have in the normal times, we were embalming every week and it's just really slowed down because of COVID. Um, you know, we, we normally would get 60 bodies a year. We went, we dropped to like six. I mean, it was quite the drop off. and I'm hoping that'll start to come back to, to life. But like if you're in an embalming lab and, and we have a long bone donor, okay, you'll probably be there until five. If you're in an embalming lab and we're just covering a unit and we're not doing any preps, okay, maybe you're just there an hour, hour and a half, two hours. Just depends on, on, on what's happening in the class that particular day. Now, the part-time or the evening classes, um, that, um, that, that takes anywhere between one and two and a half years, depending on how many classes you want to take. I need anybody taking a part-time to at least take two classes per semester, just so we can graduate you in time. Um, we have certain standards we need to keep for the accreditor. Um, and then, again, it's here at the campus for the evening classes, which are also blended. Um, you know, like I said, can be completed in one year if you started in the spring, but that's sort of a different conversation. I know that I do have a couple of students that are wrapping up prereqs in the fall and then taking um, their, their normal, they're, they're starting full time in the spring. I'll sort of show you how that works. Um, so fall 2021, COVID-19, 20, COVID we are getting back to normal. Um, classes last year were distanced, so we would meet in this type of a, of a setting. Um, overall, it was not great for our grades. I know that um, in the assessments that I did, grades dropped off quite a bit um, because this is not as engaging. But now because of the vaccines, et cetera, um, it's reverting back to normal. Um, we're projected to be back on campus, but again, that's always subject to change, but I, 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 we are, are, are shooting to be back in late August. Um, I think they gave us a date of, I'm going to say August 16th, but I, I, I don't remember the exact that um, like the, the people that work on campus will be able to come back. Like I was on campus yesterday and still just a ghost town. There's just nobody there. It's really weird. But staff and stuff is expected to come back in late August. Um, that will be good. That'll mean Janine's back in the office and 
we can actually start physical files for you guys because it's been a nightmare trying to keep track of everyone in this weird distance thing. So what I don't know yet are things like if a vaccine will be required. I know certain schools were saying that. I know um, Rutgers, for example, was saying that um, you know, if a student wants to come back, they have to be vaccinated. They haven't told us if we had to be vaccinated. Um, I personally have not been vaccinated and I don't think I'll be getting one. Um, but, you know, again, it's, it's, I, I don't know what the school's doing. They have not made any overt statements saying that they'll require you to prove that you've been vaccinated to come back. And I would assume by now they would have if that was the game plan. But again, it's, there's always that possibility. Um, and I don't know if masks will be required. Um, I, I know that there was talk of putting like plastic shields up in front of like the desks, like the like the the instructors' desks or the professors, so that they're behind that plastic shield. I don't know. I, I don't know what they're doing. I'm 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 personally I'm over this whole thing, and and I just want to get life back to normal. So I don't know if these things are going to be required. They require us to have masks now because I teach lab on campus, and I was teaching lab last night, and we had to have masks while we we're there on campus, which is silly, but it's. If it's what we got to do, it's what we got to do. All right, so the, the schedule, the full-time schedule looks like this. If you're doing, and, and to do this schedule, you have to have um, all the prereqs done and you have to have an internship. Um, the day classes and the evening classes operate at a different pace. Um, and if you are in, for example, um, embalming one, which is a theory of embalming class, it moves much faster if you are familiar with embalming techniques, if you're working in a prep room, if you've seen embalmings and that type of a thing, it's much less abstract. Um, so it's, it's Monday, intro on law, uh, Wednesday, embalming one, and then everybody meets at one o'clock for a seminar. And these are all in the same classroom. It's all in BS314, which is the funeral service classroom. So seminars one to two, where we all meet together, and then we split it two, um, and, and half of the class goes to field experience, half of the class goes to lab. Now, to even step foot in the lab, you need to have that internship in place. Um, you know, it's Legally, we are a funeral home. You know, we're a mortuary that's what we're considered for the, to the state of New Jersey. Um, so it, it's, it's, you know, and, and a quick note of explanation, embalming lab is exactly what you would think it is. It's we're embalming in the lab. Um, and field experience is the other half of that equation. What do you do as a funeral director? What do you do as an arranger? Um, you know, how do you conduct services? That type of a thing. I, th I think that's much more complicated than embalming. Um, these two classes have a um, external component to them um, where you um, have to do so many embalmings and so many sets of funeral arrangements and an embalming observation, so many work, hours of work at the funeral home. That's all stuff that we'll cover in the first day of class. And then Friday is just nine to noon. The spring semester works very similarly on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday schedule. Now, if going part-time, if, it, if it's a situation where you don't have an internship in place or if um, you um, are, are, are looking to take evening classes or whatever the case may be <clears throat> and in the fall it would just be micro and intro monday nights and thursday nights um and then this again um and then the, the spring it ratchets up um to uh monday pathology and funeral service law and tuesday i'm bombing one and uh principles of funeral service uh this if if there, there is a possibility if um, you know somebody has not taken, if somebody is, is just just starting in the spring, um, there is intro that's offered on Thursday nights. So you could conceivably just start in the spring and still wrap up at the same time because it would be the three summer classes following the spring. And I know this says 2021 and 2020. The classes are going to be the same. It was just, it was a pain to change these pictures out. And since there's four of them, I was like, I'll just explain it. It's, it's just easier. So it would be exactly the same. Um, if pursuing this path by the summer, you need to have the internship because um, that's when you would have field experience in a bombing lab. Um, and then this, this particular path wraps in the fall. So even if you were, um, you know, looking to go full time in the fall of this year, but you weren't able to, because maybe you don't have an internship or whatever the case may be, this only pushes you back one semester. You know, instead of wrapping up in the spring, you wrap up in the fall. All right, so the funeral service program handbook. Um, there's a link to that in the um, uh, in in the link that I put out. Um, this basically outlines everything about the program that you can imagine. Um, we'll take a quick look at it at the end. I just want to show you a couple pages in it. Um, it's not something you need to sit and study, but it just gives you. It's a good reference book. Um, there's three different degrees. 
and people always ask me about this. I don't think we do a real good job of explaining this on our website, but there's the prep degree, which is that's really geared at somebody who doesn't have 60 credits. The state of New Jersey and Pennsylvania require 60 credits, which is two years of schooling prior to funeral service education. They don't care what it's in, um, but just so long as it exists. So we developed the prep degree, which satisfies those 60 credits. Now, what everybody here will be looking at is really everybody does a funeral service certificate, and this is what you need to get licensed. If you have the um, uh, all of the prereqs, and we'll talk about them in a minute, plus three additional classes, a mathematics class, a um, uh, a, a humanities or global perspective, and, and um, you either have a health class or you've completed a degree, then you would also get the associate's degree. The associate's degree, if you don't have a degree, I say it's a good thing to get just in case you ever go out of state. But if you already have a degree, it's not really necessary. It's not going to give you anything different. Like you're not going to get like a higher paying job as a result of it. People just want to know if you're licensed or not and if you're competent. So, okay, so like I was saying before, New Jersey and PA both require the 60 credits. Move this thing so I can see what I'm doing. There we go. There we go. So uh, both New Jersey and PA require the 60 college credits prior to funeral service education. Generally, it doesn't matter what it's in, just as long as, it's, as you have two years of schooling. The um, Department of Education proves that this has been completed. <clears throat> and this is done in, in Pennsylvania. They issue a pre-professional educational certificate. New Jersey issues an academic qualifying certificate, which they make it complicated because they also call it a mortuary qualifying certificate. It's the same thing. An AQC and an MQC is the same exact thing. And this has to be this has to be issued before you can sit for the practical exam. This is your responsibility and, and like I said, completely independent of us. Um, and, and I'll show you how you get this done. But this is one of those weird things where specifically in New Jersey, you can get through everything else. And if you don't have this, then you can't sit for that practical exam. And it can take them up to six months to issue this thing. And I've seen students get stuck in this situation before. And it's not good that they've, they've done everything else. They've done all the testing. They've completed the schooling. Um, you know, and now all of a sudden they can't, um, you know, they can't um, sit for the practical exam. Um, like I said, it's, it's, it's a weird thing, but it's good to do at the outset, um, at the start of your internship. So it's just one less thing that you had to worry about. So, the prerequisites to the program, um, uh, English one and two, and I know I've met with most of you individually, um, and 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 I think you all have this, but I don't know. That's an individual thing. You have to take a look at your own transcripts or ask me. Uh, English one and two, psychology, business law, accounting, chemistry, and then human anatomy, which is a Mercer class, or anatomy and physiology one and two. Um, you know, if you don't have any of these, let me know, and we'll talk about how to best to move forward. But um, you know these really need to be done before you start the program. <clears throat> All right, so licensing requirements in New Jersey, the licensing requirements are the educational requirements, which is what we give, with sixty credits plus with the schooling, <clears throat> plus the internship and the exams. So the internship, regardless of your schooling, it'll be two years by default. And it can be done concurrently. Like if you had no schooling whatsoever and you had to do that initial cre 60 credits, you can do an internship during that time. They allow you to do so. But if you have 90 or more credits prior to funeral service education, they drop the minimum, uh, the, the minimum time requirement down to one year instead of two years. So if need be, you can extend it up to three years. But this all goes back to that AQC. When you file that academic qualifying certificate, what they'll have you do is they'll have you send transcripts in and they take a look at it. And you have, if you have 90 or more credits, they let the state board know and the state board goes, oh, okay, you can be done in one year if, you know, if, if you're able to do it that, that quickly. And during the internship, you have to do 75 funerals, 75 embalmings and 25 sets of funeral arrangements. Um, the, as far as the testing is concerned, um, there's the national board exam, which is the big one. And that's when you schedule on your own. Um, we clear you for it. And then you um, are able to uh, contact a testing center and um, Pearson View testing centers, and you schedule it on your own. And there's the New Jersey jurisprudence exam, which we clear you for. And it's given at Mercer, but it has nothing to do with us. We just happen to have a contract with the state. Um, and then there's a practical exam. Now, like I said, the practical is when they actually come out and watch you and bomb someone, but everything else has to be done for you to take this practical exam. You have to have the 75, 75, and 25 done, the national jurisprudence exam, um, you know, the, the AQC has to have been issued. All that stuff needs to be done before you can take the practical. Oh, Pennsylvania, again, very similar. 
It'd be educational requirements plus internship and exams. So following schooling in PA, you start a resident internship and that's a 12 month period. Um, and you have to do 35 case histories during that time. And it's just, you, you, you do everything on a service. You do the embalming, the arrangements, you, you direct the service, and then you submit that information to the state. And you have to do 35 of them during that year. You can take all the testing during this year. The National Board, the jurisprudence, and the written practical can all be done during this resident internship. Now, while you're in school, you can register as a student slash funeral trainee. And the, here again, they just give it two names. I don't know why. Um, this is, again, while you're in the funeral service education program, you register as a student or funeral trainee and you just need to find a funeral home. And then they, um, you know, what happens is there's an application on the state's website and there's a portion of it that I need to fill out. And um, then, you know, you, you send that into the state and you're good to go. This allows you to do embalmings um, and everything else in funeral service at the funeral home while you are and while you are in school. Now, if you call the state board, the state board will say, no, 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 you're not allowed to do that, but it's nonsense. The state board in Pennsylvania is notoriously bad. And we actually had to write to the state attorney general to get a ruling on it. And they said, yeah, absolutely. You're allowed to, to do embalming. So if anybody's in PA and they need that letter, that's not a problem. I, I have a copy of it. Delaware, I don't think we have anybody in Delaware right now. So I'm just gonna skip over that one. All right, so the questions, just things that we don't want to be snuck up on anybody down the road. Um, I've had some weird stories over the years, but um, on all of the applications, they ask you about your, your background. Um, child support, please certify under penalty of perjury the following. Do you currently have a child support obligation? Have you failed to respond to a subpoena relating to either a paternity or child support proceeding? Are you the subject of a child support related arrest warrant? Um, and again, I, this is the New Jersey example. Pennsylvania has very, very similar questions um, in accordance with NJSA, blah, 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 and answer of yes to any of these questions may result in the denial of licensure. Furthermore, any false certification of the above may subject you to a penalty, including but not limited to immediate rev revocation or suspension of license or certification. And it goes on. Have you ever been summoned, arrested, taken into custody, indicted, tried, charged with, admitted in pretrial intervention, or pled guilty to any violation of law, ordinance, felony, misdemeanor, or disorderly person's uh, offense? In New Jersey, any other state, District of Columbia, or any other jurisdiction, parking and speeding violations need not be disclosed, but motor vehicle violations such as driving while impaired or intoxicated must be. Have you ever been convicted of any crime or offense under any circumstances? This includes, but it's not limited to a plea of guilty, no vault, no con contendiary, no contest, or a finding of guilt by a judge or jury. If yes, please provide a judgment, a copy of the judgment of conviction and the release from the parole or probation. Please provide a complex by explanation, et cetera, and so forth. Um, and do you currently hold or have you ever held a professional or occupational license or sort of uh, certificate of any kind in New Jersey or any other state, District of Columbia, blah, 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 blah. If uh, you've had any sort of run in with the law, disclose it to the state when you're applying. Um, I've, I don't judge. I've had some weird situations. I had a student come down once and talk to me. He wanted to talk to me in my office after class. And he started off by saying, well, I used to be a teacher. And I was like, oh, this is not going anywhere good. And he, he apparently had uh, had an affair or stuff with one of his students, you know, and the student was a senior. Not that that makes it better, but legally over the age or whatever. But, um, you know, I was like, oh, my God, I was like, dude, I don't think you're going to like, I don't think they're going to approve you. And they ended up approving him. He went in and gave a very eloquent speech about how he had paid his debt to society and what's he going to do, you know, work in a liquor store for the rest of his life. And they, they saw it his way. So even if it's a serious thing, um, you know, it's, it's better to get out in front of it. And if you don't have an internship and haven't been through this process yet, we don't want you to get started and then find out later on that, oh, maybe they're not going to approve you for licensure. Um, in most cases, so long as it's not something atrociously bad, it's normally not a big deal. Um, you know, the, uh, I did have a student come in once and, and she was, again, I was so surprised. She was such a nice, nice lady. And she was like, yeah, I was involved in a double homicide. And I was like, oh my God. Um, she ended up switching out of careers. Um, I, I don't know if she would have been approved or not. She never got that far into it, but, um, you know, if you, if you don't disclose this and let's say you get licensed and then the state finds out about it 10 years down the road, they're going to take your license. Uh, you know, that would still be considered fraud. You know, um, it's, it's fraud by omission is what it's considered. 
um, you know, God forbid, you do have something in your criminal record, you're licensed five or 10 years and your competition finds out about your, your previous arrest or something, you know what I mean? Like it's just best to get out in front of it. And questions about that, feel free to ask me. I, I've heard some weird stuff over the years. I don't judge, it's, it's shit happens, right? All right, so funeral service program policy. All grades have to be a C or above and our C is a 75. And that's the minimum passing grade for the national. So that's what we ping everything to. Um, as far as repeating courses, you are allowed, and I hopefully this doesn't affect anybody. You are allowed to repeat courses twice without an issue. If you have to take a course for a third time, you need to get uh, departmental permission, meaning that you have to um, get the dean's permission um, and, and my permission as well. Um, but the, and, and the current dean, we have an interim dean right now, but we had a dean before, Dr. Maddox, whose father was a funeral director. And he took this very seriously. And he really, he was, he was tough on it, man. Um, good guy, he just took it very, very seriously. Um, incomplete grades. Now, uh, the, the, the lab and field experience, the classes where there is external work, clinical work that has to be done in bombings and um, bombing observation, so many sets of funeral arrangements, so many funerals, all of the funeral home. Um, if you get to an end of the semester and you're not done the work that's needed, you've, you've done all the classwork, it just happens to be that you don't have the, the, the clinical work done, we give you an incomplete and the school allows you to take an additional semester to, to finish that work. So they give you essentially an additional 15 weeks. So let's say you get to the end of fall and you're not done. Well, you're, you're in bombing observation or something. You actually have until May to get that done. And, and we ask that you don't put it off, but you know, it's, it's one of those situations that we sort of built that in there just as a, a safety mechanism. Um, tests, there are really no makeup exams. Now this varies by instructor and on situations. I mean, uh, uh, nobody is heartless and like I had a student that contacted me after a test and, and she had to take her daughter to a hospital unexpectedly. Like, that's fine if there's some legitimate reason, but if there's not, I'm, you know, I had a student who actually failed a class a couple of years ago because she just blew off a test and then she blew off the, the she actually had her reason the first time, then she blew off the makeup exam. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not giving it to you. <laughs> like, it's, it's just not, not happening, you know. Um, the tests themselves are, are, are not given for students' retention. You know, because we, we don't want them out there. It's a small enough community and funeral service that if everybody's able to keep their tests, our tests would be meaningless inside of six months, you know? Um, so, but we do review them in class. We hand them out, I review them, and then we, we collect them all and, and, and take them. But we don't let you keep them. We don't let you take pictures of them or anything like that. Um, otherwise, we'd have to write new tests every single semester. <clears throat> um, program completion this is another big one, but I hope it doesn't affect anybody in here. Let me just move that up there. There we go. Um, due to the evolving nature of funeral service, our accreditor, the American Board of Funeral Service Education, gives a one and a half times to complete, right? So, meaning that um, basically after three years, classes are no longer usable and must be, re uh, must be repeated. And I've had this, I have a student right now in the program. She was out, she had finished everything except for two classes, but she was gone 10 years. And I was like, I'm sorry, there's nothing I could do in this situation. I mean, I'm stuck. The accreditor has it written out. And 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 if it's in an accrediting standard, I, I have zero option in that, you know? So let's say you get started, you're halfway through the program and life gets in the way. And I understand that happens. Sometimes people have a change of life. They move, they get married, they have a kid, whatever, right? And you're gone for more than three years, then you have to start back at the beginning, regardless of how far into it you are. Um, oh, last thing on your NBE prep, FUN 299. That's the only optional class, um, the only elective in the program. This is NBE preparation. It's a capstone. It's a one credit course. If you're in county, it costs like, if you're in the state of New Jersey, I'd say it costs like 200 bucks to take. It's not terribly expensive. I highly recommend taking this. It's just a good review at the end of everything. And, and it sort of helps get you ready for that national board exam. Um, <clears throat> all right. That, <clears throat> excuse me, the hepatitis B vaccination. One of the things we're going to need from you is a hepatitis B vaccination. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the reason we have you do this is because we need to know that you know that a, a funeral home, if you start working at a funeral home by federal law, within 10 days of your employment, they must make available to you at no cost the hepatitis B vaccination. Um, it's, uh, and it's something I don't care whether you take it or not. That's completely up to you. 
Uh, but we just need to know that you that we have informed you of it. So, and I'll probably wait till we're back on campus to worry about this. Um, and it's just a formal handout. You check off on it. Like I have received the hepatitis B vaccination. You just send in a copy of it. Uh, excuse me. I do not wish to receive it. Um, I'm currently receiving the vaccine series. It's a shot. It's a series of three shots. And I'll provide a copy of the vaccination record upon completion. So, to, like I said, just a form that we 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 have you sign off on so that we we know that you you were aware of this. <clears throat> so registering, <clears throat> excuse me, with the state board. Again, that has to be done to enroll in the day classes, um, just because of the pace that they that they move, um, and it's especially needed for field experience in bombing lab. Um, and you must have the registration process completed to take a bombing lab. You know, field experience is a classroom based class, but it does have clinical work. So if you had a funeral home and you're in the process of getting registered, that's fine. But it, it, even to walk into the lab, I need you fully registered. Um, both classes require embalmings, funerals, embalming observations, et cetera, be completed at the funeral home. Um, New Jersey, if you're in New Jersey and you're registered, you're going to be embalming the bodies and doing funerals to get to the 75, 75, and 25. All right, hold on a second. Hold on, give me one second. Sorry, I'm on call for the funeral home. And uh, it's just always the case. As soon as you start something, uh, you get paged through on something. So in New Jersey, while you're in this class, and if you had to do you know, 15 embalmings, right? You also, you can use those 15 for both the state of New Jersey to get to that 75 and for the program. They can be used for both at the same time. All right, so that AQC, that academic qualifying certificate. Don't mind the noise in the background. My three-year-old is just waking up. Um, the AQC, or Pre-Professional Educational Certificate. Remember, this proves the, the, that you have the 60 credits prior to funeral service education. The way that they do this in both states, and I don't know why, is they do this through teacher certificate information system online. It makes no sense to me. But this is where you would go and you create a, uh, a, a login <clears throat> and... Uh, <clears throat> You, uh, this, you, you basically fill this out, you pay them, I wouldn't say it's like 35 bucks, and then you have to have your transcripts mailed to the, mailed or sent digitally to the state of New Jersey. Um, and like I said, this is how we get it to the Department of Education. Pennsylvania is very similar. They use the TIMS site. <clears throat> and again, <clears throat> excuse me, login instructions for educators. You know, again, it's, I don't know why they do this in PA in New Jersey, uh, you know, I guess because of the Department of Education, but they make it look like it's a teacher certification that you're doing. It's, it's strange, but this is legitimately where you have to do that. Some other requirements for field experience in lab. Um, there's a yellow application form. And again, I think this is something I'm going to wait and just give out the first day in class. Um, that hepatitis B survey will need a copy of your intern card. This is not as important anymore. They're not really issuing paper copies right now. So that's something we'll probably just get offline. Um, and there's also an inspection report that we'll need at the funeral home. And I'll cover why in just a second. Um, all right, so here's this application, the first thing on that list, right? The yellow application form. These are when these are all color coded when we're, when we're physically in campus, physically on campus. And this is an agreement between the funeral home and the school. And this allows you to take work that you're doing at the funeral home, like the embalmings and bring that to, you know, use that for school. It allows us to do the embalming observation with you. Um, you know, because we'll do that at the funeral home where I will assign a field supervisor who will physically come out and watch you embalm a body. This is the inspection report I referenced a second ago. And this is on one page, double-sided. Um, the, the, the reason that we need this, and, and, and if you are at a funeral home 
and I'll go over this in class on the first day as well. Mention this to your preceptors because this is relatively new. This has only been around for a couple of years. And this, is an, uh, this goes back to an accrediting standard. The accreditor said any place that you have a student that you're awarding credit, you need to go out and physically do an inspection of their, of their building to make sure they are not in a dangerous environment. This is really more of a formality. Like this, this was passed at a national level and it makes sense in areas with very little oversight. Um, Arkansas, for example, students were le legitimately in dangerous environments. Um, they didn't have correct PPE. There was, you know, there was one story about like live wires that were above a bombing table that were like hanging down electrical work. It wasn't like just wacky stuff, but you just don't find that in New Jersey or Pennsylvania. So we had to fill this thing out and then somebody comes out and just does a, a five minute walk through the funeral home. It, and it's not something we're gonna sneak up and do. It's not like a spot check. We'll call, we'll schedule a time to come in and, and then we, we handle it that way. Um, this is what the Hep B, vac uh, Hep B vaccination form looks like. Like I said, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to hand this out first day. Last year was a mess. We emailed them all out. It's just a pain to keep track of digitally. If I can just hand that to you and then collect it, it just makes my life so much easier. All right, so one of the links that I put on there um, was to scholarships. This is not in any sense an exhaustive search of, of scholarships. This is just a quick list that we put together. Um, there's a ton of scholarships out there, tons and tons and tons of money. And the number one complaint I get from these people is that they do not get enough applicants. Um, so if you want to apply for any of these, please do so. Um, if you need our help, just let me know. I just sent a letter off two or three days ago to, uh, to, to an organization on behalf of a student in the hopes that they'll get a scholarship. Mercer actually has three scholarships as well that are given out. If you look at the school's website and just put in scholarships, you'll see that there are three that are geared up at, at funeral service. And it all adds up. Some might just be like a couple hundred bucks, but it, it adds up. You know, some are much larger. I know SCI gives out like a couple five grand scholarships. Um, SCI is Service Corp International. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we, we like to see you guys receive these. It's, it's a good thing to say. It's, um, and again, here's some additional ones. And like I said, there are links to all of this on that link that I put into the chat. And again, even more, American Board of Funeral Service Education, um, you know, the, the Mercer Foundation, Funeral Service Foundation, Academic Scholarship, Second Career Scholarship, Order of the Golden Rule, Awards of Excellence Scholarship Program. Like I said, this is not at all exhaustive. There's a ton of these things out there. Ah, so one of the last pages in the um, handbook is a list of all of the textbooks. Um, we give it to you now, and if you go to the school's website, and if you look up any class, it, there are, are we list the um, all syllabi on the website. So if you are taking intro in the fall and you will see what books you need for it, you just go put in FUN 206 into a search, it'll come up for you. You can look at the syllabus, oh, here are the textbooks. So we give it to you ahead of time in case you wanna start looking at a text. You don't have to get the text from Mercer. You can get them on Amazon, or I know I see a lot of times, even on Facebook, um, what's that? Uh, and Bombers Who Care um, page, which has like 15,000 followers or something. Um, I see people selling textbooks on there all the time. Now, certain ones, you can get older copies of it. Like this history of... Question for us on the show. Okay, yeah. Um, he wants to make these comments to go on um, long-term care so that he can get on Medicaid so that he wants to share it to the chat. I, what's today? What? Hold on a minute. I got you. Um, sorry again. You know, family's calling about. Um, making arrangements. But uh, anyway, certain ones on here, History of American Funeral Directing. That is one of the oldest books that, that's around. They have these newer editions, but that was first published, I think, in 1957. And it's it's hasn't changed a great deal since then. So if you can find an older copy of that, great. Um, other ones like Embalming History, Theory, and Practice, we're on to the fifth edition. I wouldn't say to go back further than the third. Um, you know, But if you have questions about any of those, just feel free to ask me. Um, 
but like I said, we give these to you ahead of time just so you can, if you want to go out and get them now, you can. Now, the last appendix in the handbook is we, we included what we call the anatomical guide to limits. And this is one of the tougher things in the curriculum. I, I kind of wish they would pull this out of the curriculum. And we're not going to give you a pop quiz on this first day or anything, but we just give it to you in case I, I've had students that want to get out in front of this and they want to start looking this stuff up and they want to start studying it now. And that's perfectly fine. And all these do, and we'll talk about these in class, but these are just wildly complicated in, in the way that they're presented. The common carotid is posterior to the medial border of the sternocleidomastoidus, right? It's just, a, it's a mouthful. Um, so we give it to you in case you do want to get out in front of it. Uh, how about Tuesday? Perfect. Sorry. My wife um, also works at the funeral home, so she's handling the folks that are calling, looking to make arrangements. So like I said, we give them to you so you can get out in front of it if you choose to. We're not going to give you a quiz on it the first day or anything, but it's, it's just information we felt that you should have. Oh, also, if you go to our website, and we're, we've been trying to get this updated, um, we have to disclose a whole bunch of information, um, according to credit, like pass rates, things like that, as far as the, um, the national board is concerned, and um, as far as, you know, the graduation rate, and how many people graduated on time, and how many didn't finish, and employed, employed in funeral service, all of that stuff. So all of that is, is listed there on, on the website. And like I said, this is just an older picture of it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's stuff that we just have to, to put onto the website for uh, um, you know, as just general info. Oh, that's it. So questions about it? I just, I know I just throw a whole bunch at you there. Let's see. All right, so last thing I wanna look at real quick is just the handbook, like I said, you can get this from the um, uh, right on the uh, in those links that I that I put up there. Um, this outlines pretty much like I said anything you ever want to know about the program, everything that we just covered. You know everything we were just talking about the prereqs, timely graduation, it, if you have an incomplete um, information about you know preceptors. You know uh, uh, when we get back to physically being in school, we do have physical copies of this that you're welcome to. Um, should you want one. Um, this is the paperwork that we use when you're in lab and field experience. Um, these and this will be like a green form. Um, <clears throat> and this is, you know, you have to do so many hours of work at the funeral home. Um, and specifically when you're in lab and field experience. And, uh, you know, that's how we track that. This is how we track the embalmings. Um, there'd be embalming, uh, an embalming page on the back side of that is a funeral page. So you have to do so many funerals, so many embalmings. Um, so we set the funeral arrangements. Um, and then when we do an embalming observation, this is the criteria that we use for it. And this is the form that we fill out. Um, and when you're in those classes, your, your, your preceptor um, plays a part in your grade. Um, they, they send that letter back to us, giving you a grade and that affects your final grade. Um, uh, and this is that application I was talking about, um, which is just an agreement between like I said, the school and the funeral home so that you can do that work there. So yeah, so. Oh, this is a real good thing to, to take a look at. This appendix here, appendix eight, this outlines everything you need to finish the program. It's not a bad idea to just print this up and fill out as you go along, just to make sure that you have everything that you need so you can track yourself. Um, and just a list of everything that you need to do. Oh, I actually need to update this. You don't need to apply for graduation anymore, but I might change that for, for, the, for the spring, but we'll see. Um, that inspection report that I was telling you about. Um, yeah, the anatomical guide to limits and uh, hepatitis B vaccination. Um, then the textbooks, so. Yeah, oh, good. Questions about any of that? All right. Um, one last thing, if I could get everybody who's here, if I could just get you to type your name into the chat. Because what I do is since I've recorded this, it saves the chat. And then that way I can create a checklist and go, oh, okay, here's the folks I've gone through orientation with. Here's who I still need to do it with. Because normally I would have you sign off on a form. I'd normally have you sign off on all those forms that were there. So.
when you are ready to um, register for classes, like I said, let me know. I'll get Janine to register you. And um, one last thing you have to, if she registers you, you need to pay for classes within 24 hours or at least make a payment or else the system automatically drops you, which is a real dumb system. If you do get dropped, it's not the end of the world. We never get to the point that we're turning away students, you know, so it's, you're not gonna lose your seat in the class. It's just a pain that you have to go back in and re-register. So, so again, if I could get everybody who's here, just type your name into the chat real quick. Thank you. Just that way it records it and I can sort of go back and, and figure out, okay, I've, you know, uh, Lexanne has been here. Great. I, I don't need to track her down about orientation. Uh, I'm only missing the one. Michelle, if you could type your name in there just so I can, I'll have that in my chat log and we'll be able to record that you've been here. So, yeah, good. Any questions? This is a quiet group. A year ago, this really weirded me out. I've gotten used to it over the past year. So, all right, good. So, like I said, when you're ready to register for classes, let me know. And uh, if you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll, I'll look to see everybody in September, the week after. Labor Day is when we get started. So, folks, have a good rest of the summer. And um, yeah, I will see you guys in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Have a good day. As you do the same. <laughs>